Yeah, okay. Hi, ladies. It's me. I would say ladies and gentlemen, but the gentleman's redundant. <laughs> Certainly, I'm not one. <laughs> uh, anyway, this, uh, we're going to have a little get-together, and it's basically a challenge that was thrown down last time. Like, you know, what is this about? Uh, give us some examples. Give us some idea what you're talking about. You know, it's all hairy-fairy. So I put together a few tidbits. And it's very important you understand their titbits, right? <laughs> I've got this mountain of things. <laughs> I've pulled a couple of little, little tiny peanut-sized things out to show you. Um, but I hope it'll give you an idea. You're looking for two or three things, right? Is this interesting? Has it got value? Uh, is, it, is it different? Because, you know, if everybody else is teaching it, there's no point. And also, there is another uh, question, which is, could I do this? Right? You know, could I do what the doc's doing? You know, it's all well, very well for him. He's been doing it for years. But... Um, and uh, so I want to show you that too, that anyone can do what I'm doing once you understand the principles. We're going to look at various ways of exchanging information and getting into that dialogue. The obvious one is a, a flip chart, you know, where you say, but even, even that you'll see is going to be very interactive. You're going to do most of the construction on the, on the board. We know that being interactive is very important for study and learning. Then we're going to do a special kind of a group, interactive group, kind of reading thing, which anyone can do in their lounge. You know, you don't need a classroom setting or anything. All that's really required is, you know, everyone sharing a set of the materials. And I came across a pretty uh, interesting way of doing that with, uh, late, in the late 60s. So it goes back a while. Uh, and a couple of other things. Oh, yes, I wanted to show something on Debbie because she was clearly interested in it. Something that you can do with kids and I can teach you in 20 minutes how to do it. Half an hour's better, but you know it doesn't need long, because for one thing it'll be spinning off the, the the group reading that we're going to do. So I'll just say right, there's a slight variation of that, which I'll, so they will watch while we do it. I'll pre I'm going to pretend you're a six-year-old child, <laughs> and you can pretend I'm a 66-year-old adult. Right? <laughs> uh, so the, so the first model then is going to be just like doing a talk. But there's one of the things I'd like to share with you. Last time, did we, I think we shared a bit about the emotional ladder last time, didn't we? It's just a, just a sampler, really. But this time, I'm going to talk about what I call the R zones. Now, I've got a feeling I might have mentioned that, or at least how it came about, you know, that I decided it, was, it sounded a bit like erogenous zones, so that would interest people. <laughs> um, but it just means R for responsibility. And it's just a way of breaking up life into slices, um, and you can, I've got to say, you can slice it up in all kinds of other ways. The question is, what's valuable? You know, you could say, well, let's just consider, right, humankind, and then all other living things, and then the physical universe. But I can't say that's very much use. Um, it, it's certainly true. Or you could divide it into sort of 500 little tiny slices, you know, <laughs> nephews, nieces, you know, bosses, old bosses, uh, ex-wives, ex-girlfriends. You know, you just divide it up. Uh, into so many slices it becomes meaningless and doesn't help. So I've, decided, I've divided mine into 12, okay? And these are what I call my 12 R zones. And I'd like to boast that it will give you a different look on things like sanity, for example. You could use this to define the term sanity, actually, you know, even as a legal term. Or rationality and reason. It has to do with ethics and right and wrong and all kinds of other things can play off this. So, you know, it's quite a big concept if we can work this out. So let's take a look at this together, right? First thing I want to do is list and talk, and then we're going to try and find visual structures that will work for it, that will make it more interesting. As I said, this is purely my way of looking at things, but I'm going to start, my number one is self. It's a good place to start. Uh, and I'm going to say self within. Now, there's another das aspect, to, or another dimension to self, which I'll come to. But the, the self within, the thoughts inside, you know, how you feel, the personality you've got, that will be my zone one. And you've got quite a big responsibility there. You know, it's not, you're not entitled to run around like a loony, shouting and screaming and upsetting people's lives. Are you, really, if you think about it? So it is a, an important zone of responsibility. Can let's have an example from a couple of you, what you might consider to be one's internal environment that we are responsible for. Could be something like projection of my emotions. Yes, that's true, yeah. Your emotional habits, they very much impact the environment, don't they? Health. Well, health, yeah, that's another one, yeah. If you're 
in crummy health, <laughs> people around you obviously usually get drawn into the problem more or less, more or less inexorably. Yeah, so those, those are two, two good ones. So that's the sort of world within, the self world within. But what about the self without, you know, the outside world? I separate that out. So, if self is energy, that's the self within, it's also without. Yes, that's true. Yes, but the, the, the effect of this will spread outwards. But I'm, I'm focusing on what it is, and in this case, it's your inner, inner environment, your inner feelings. Uh, they, it will spread out through all of the twelve. We'll, of course, we're, we'll agree on that at the end. <clears throat> but there's this aspect of ourselves that's within, like the car you drive. Um, play golf or, <laughs> you know, whatever you do. Any examples for uh, uh, what you're responsible for that's self, but is outside the mind and body? That's what you read, what you, what yeah. you watch. Yeah. Um, well, so, you, so your CDs, your DVDs, your books exactly. would be a very good, a very good second environment, wouldn't it? So that's our zone too. Anyone else? Do you want to have a crack bit? Nope. Um, yeah, friends, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. Clothes you wear. Uh, clothes you wear is a good one, obvious from you. <laughs> 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 friends will come a bit later, as we'll see. Uh, yes, okay, so we've got, we've got zones one and zone two. Now, zone three is going to, I'm, I'm going to use the word sex because it's short, but I really mean romantic partner, you know, that sort of relationship. Let's put romantic. Uh, the, the person that we're deeply involved with on the sort of spiritual love aspect, uh, that, you know, we use words like spouse or partners or, or whatever, uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, you know, the deep commitment part. That's our zone, that's my zone three, okay? And it, it clearly exists whether you inhabit that or not. You know, if you're a monk or a nun and you don't go there or you tell people you're not going there, uh, it's, still, it's, it's still, there, still there as a blank space, right? <laughs> Um, so uh, that's him. so we, we all know what that is. Okay, we don't really need examples of that. I guess. Is there anything you think that might not qualify? You know, would a so and so qualify or not qualify? Well, anything even puzzling? A, even a single person that is visualizing what they want as a romantic or yes, so a sort of empty booth. You're mm -hmm. saying would would still count mm -hmm. <laughs> even if there's nobody. To fill it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, good, a good because point. You're filling it with hopes, ideas, and dreams. Yeah, descriptions of the yeah. person. And, yeah, very good point. Yeah, nobody's mm -hmm. ever brought that up. That's good. All righty. So number four, I'm going to do the other part of it, uh, family, which is connected with sex, of course. You know, the protoplasm. Well, let's call it protoplasm. Um, and this is very important to a lot of cultures. We don't give it perhaps quite as much as we should in the West, but still, it shows. Uh, you know, the protoplasm line, so-called, you know, like going back through your ancestors and going forward down through the kids and down through ever so many generations. That's, we're responsible for that too. You know, the Jews think seven generations ahead, I'm told. I'm, I've never been part of the Jewish faith, but I'm told that's part of their work and belief system. Uh, that's, that's a lot of future, that's a lot of generations, isn't it, to actually t try and take care down ever so many generations like that. I think that's pretty good. But also it goes backwards. You know, our ancestors, uh, it's not just cute just to honor an ancestors. They do actually have a tremendous impact on us. If you, uh, do anyone know homeopathy or anyone really not know homeopathy? Don't know. Perhaps that would be the better thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a healing science developed by a German guy called Hahnemann. And you don't need all the details of it, but it's a natural way of treating things, you know, using like herbs and things. But the big specialty, part of that specialty is you use mimics. So if you want to heal a sore throat, you would take a remedy that produces a sore throat. Okay, so like, like cures like, was his saying. Well, you don't want to take stuff just to poison yourself and give yourself a lousy sore throat, right? Or if you, you know, if you got heart pain, you don't want to take something that'll make you go uh, uh, and fall over. So what they do is dilute it ever so many times, so it doesn't have the disastrous physical effect, but still has the signal that pushes off the disease. That's as much as you need to know. But what Hahnemann came up with was something called miasms, and these have really been probably his biggest discovery that there's this kind of shadow or pattern that goes down through the generations and it carries disease, it's a sort of disease imprint. The biggest of these he called the Sora, which is spelt like this, spelt with a P, 
Sora. And Sora, according to Hahnemann, is from the Black Death days. And the Sora, did I, did I use the word miasm yet? Yeah, yeah okay. So the Sora miasm. Uh, we should look that up. I should get all you guys going with Dixie. But they find it for me while I'm talking, will you? Um, maybe the smaller one here. That one. <laughs> no, just find it. I'm say, saying you need to define it for us. Uh, but that's, it's a kind of very hectic disease. Uh, it's got uh, external aspects like, you know, uh, scaly skin and hot rashes and, very, you know, very unpleasant type of things would tend to come out if you're carrying the sora or the psoriatic miasm. Uh, there's one called medarinum, which is based on gonorrhea. And another one called luisinum from the old name of syphilis, which was lose, L-E-U-S. And that, that produces a different range of illnesses. Um, but, you know, it's, a very, it's, a, it's an imprint that's come down through the generations. A lose or syphilis arrived in the Western world. They think from America. It's another gift from America, right? <laughs> uh, but they think about the, you know, pretty well Columbus's time, that probably that's when it was brought back. And it ran rampant through European society because there was no, no uh, natural immunity or anything like that. To the point by the 18th, 19th century, it, everyone was terrified of it. I mean, that had a lot more to do with fear of sex and sex outside marriage than anything the church could say. They were all just scared of getting syphilis. It's a pretty horrible way to go. They don't seem to have it in here. Have I spelled M-I-A-S. Yes, that's what I thought. Okay, don't worry about it. Yeah, we have miasma. What does that say? That's just plural. What does it say? Oh, um, vaporous exhilaration, former belief. Oh, exhalation. No, no, I know what that is. Yeah, don't worry. Okay. That, that's, uh, that's what they thought caused uh, malaria. That's the word they've stumbled across. No, it's not the same as miasm. Yeah. <laughs> no, it'll, it'll be in there, but let's not bog, let's not bog down. Okay, for, for the moment, I'm your dictionary, right? <laughs> so that's what a miasm is. <laughs> so the point, the point is, with your protoplasm line, these miasms come down, and you pass them on too. And I was just talking with Anita very briefly just before we came in, but uh, there's a f uh, an event called the Dutch Famine Winter took place at the end of World War One in Europe, 1944. It was very desperate. The Nazis hadn't pulled back. There was no food. Everything was collapsing, and the Dutch people were literally starving. And uh, they were eating like tulip bulbs and dandelions and anything they could find, you know, they were practically chewing soil to stay alive. And a lot of people died, you know, tens of thousands died. The impact of that effect ca carried on through two or three generations. It's come out in the, in the grandchildren of that particular group of people. There are problems, you know, with obesity and metabolism and things like that. So it, our ancestors really do impinge on us in a big way. And since, <laughs> since I've got the group I've got, which is small, and I know you're okay, <laughs> I'll tell you another aspect of that, <laughs> which, is what we, which is what we yeah, call... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to introduce another thing that you will meet if you stick with me through cryogenetics and over the years. The genetic being. Now, it's actually a being that thinks, and you can talk to it. It will read on that meter just the same as you would as a psychological being. Uh, and it carries memories, it carries past lives, for example. Now, past lives are not so obvious. If you think, let's, let's, let's suppose we all believe in past lives, right? Uh, and I'm not even going to ask if we all do. But it's, we're talking about the spirit, okay? So it may have been this lifetime, maybe a male, a doctor, but you know, another lifetime was a young girl and died young, and then another lifetime was a, a Roman emperor. So it's clearly the spirit is jumping around, right? But when this gets really interesting and gets really good, uh, you'll find that also the genetic being behaves in the same way, except that it doesn't jump the protoplasm. You know, if you've got a memory from your great, 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 something or other, it's in your protoplasm line and that comes down as a memory. Uh, I, was, I, I encountered this in the early 60s on a different route, but you, do you know Stanislav Groff? Okay, guy at Stanford. Um, he, he discovered some amazing things, but he was giving people LSD and, and testing what happened. This was in the days when he could, before, before Timothy Leary screwed it all up for everybody. <laughs> Other than reading this in the book, <laughs> reading that information in the book, yeah. I hadn't been aware. 
Right. Well, he, long story short, he found that he could recover mother's memories and grandmother's memories mm -hmm. from people who were under LSD. And of course, they, you know, they checked it. There were things the person couldn't possibly have known. It was, you know, 20 years before they were born, when mother was a child. But mother was able to confirm the memories very vividly. So this is the kind of territory that we're into. Very, very fascinating. And there is a genetic being which makes this protoplasm line much stronger than you think. The in, you know, so North the, American Indians so are right. the memory or history from the genetic being it is connected, but not always the same memories as the protoplasm in the family? Hardly connected. Yeah. Oh, sorry, no, the genetic being ha has connected. the family line memories. It has the family line memories, but it also has the being or the... Well, I'm calling it a genetic it. being. It's got an identity, it right. has a viewpoint, so it has a conscious that awareness. Spirit. It's no, it's not spirit. That's what I'm saying. It's different to spirit. It comes down the protoplasm line. If you start with a person as spirit and go backwards, then you'll find there were, you know, a different gender and in a different yes. place, another planet, but all this kinds is your of family. Yeah, and that's very precise. Now, I I encountered it in a strange way. I, I've been doing past lives since I was, you know, twenties, but I, I always had this fixed picture of some big, mighty Viking warrior sitting on, a, on the grass leading to a cliff with you know, a big sword there waiting, the sun's going down and the sky's getting blood red and I knew this person was there waiting for a fight. <laughs> you know, he had to meet somebody and had to fight him and kill him, hopefully. I presumed that he lost, since I still, the memory was kind of stuck, I presumed it was a death memory, you know, because those are the most violent and the ones that stick. And it was, it was a long time after, and I'm talking about over 20 years later when I went, <laughs> it was a genetic picture because my family name, Mumby, is a Viking name. So this had come down through the protoplasm line for right from the 10th or 11th century. I think I thought it was 11th century, 10 some. Uh, and it, of course, it blew instantly then, and I've never seen it since. But you know, it, was, it really haunted me for years <laughs> until I found out the truth. That's one of the things you'll find in Chrysanetics. If you get the absolute truth of something, the full truth, it just, it just disappears. Because truth has no permanence. Truth is a, a moment of creation and a moment of destruction. It's the same thing. And anything to persist or stick around must contain an untruth, and that, an, an alteration of some kind, and that's what makes it persist. Well, in this case, it was trying to assign it to the wrong thing. I was trying to assign it to me as spirit being. And uh, it was nothing to do with that. It was the genetic line. <laughs> so, um, all right, next, let's go and look at uh, zone five, which is work. Now, this is fairly crucial, actually. We, you know, we're very much defined in terms of our work. You know, it's not just something to do and you get some money. Uh, people have an, an identity being, something they do, something they're good at. If they're lucky, they get hired for that. If they're not so lucky, they get hired for something else and spend the rest of their lives wanting to slash their wrists. <laughs> but most of us who are lucky, we get to do what it was that we are actually, you know, kind of born for. But a person is still, even if you're not happy at all, you're still defined by your job. You know, a plumber is a certain type of person that fixes leaks and solders pipes and, and things like that. A doctor does certain relief work and so on. So it's a very important ethic <coughs> to us and a very important zone of responsibility, obvious. Okay, now number, what would be number six? Anyone like to make a suggestion? What we're going to go for, for number six? Kind of, yeah, that's a good one, yeah. In fact, I would say community. I, would, I think you're right. It's not the word I was going to use, but I'm, I'll put community in. I'm going to use tribes, or tribe, right? So we'll make it plural, but also, as Debbie says, there's a very strong sense of community. Any community, something you belong to, whether it's you know the golf club or the old Etonian society or, uh, God forbid, the Republican Party. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, just kidding, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> uh, no, you know what I'm saying. So any, any kind of grouping that associates you with people that think like you do, you share common values, community values, you like being together. Because, uh, you know, humankind, are, we're naturally very gregarious. We like hanging out in gangs. We don't like uh, aloneness that much. Uh, it's a nice contrast to go to from time to time as a relief. But I don't think it's a very native state to humans. You know, if you look at the, certainly the anthropological history, 
we all used to be in tribes, you know, in one well, isn't that like, why um, isolating yourself is one of the um, key questions on a psychological evaluation to depression, is if you're starting to isolate yourself from community, tribes, your friends, and things. Yes, that, it's so a that's bad sign. Like one of the number one signs. Yes, it is. It's a bad sign. You wouldn't associate that with a person who's on some kind of, you know, Zen Buddhism trip and doesn't want to talk to anybody till right. the end of the year. Yes. And he's always up in the mountains and you never see him anyway. That's a chosen phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But isolation, I mean, that's the word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, not just loneliness, but yeah, isolation, isolation. Uh, is a very pathological state for most people and they feel it very keenly, very unpleasantly. Okay, that's my, my sixth. Uh, well, let's have some tribes. Come on, tell me one of your, your so tribes, where, Terry. <laughs> where does education fall? Uh, well, it's going to fall right you're across. Without, out, you're without yourself, but you're without. It's going it's to impact. Without. It's going to impact there, there, certainly there, mm -hmm. there, and here. Maybe on the next one, but let's just do tribes before we go to the next one. Church. Church, okay. Mm -hmm. I've never asked you that question before, have I? No. Tell me a tribe you belong to. A I belong to. Hmm, West End Hellraisers in London, I <laughs> still. <laughs> Does that go back to hereditary? Yeah. Um, Not typically, no. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're referencing what I just said, two of you or about you, I was, I was making a joke, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, typically it would be something different. You know, you've got your, your fourth our own line and then this is something else other people you're associated with that are not family but you choose to enter into relationships with them mm. well i used to belong to my nutrition group yes that's true the we ion a clicky lot because we all believed in what we were doing so we spent weekends together and went to any, anything we could so that was sort of a, a tribe of people that were trying to learn something to better their health yeah mm -hmm. good example Anita. oh univera Mm -hmm. Yes, good. No, yeah. Any type of uh, any marketing type group. Of relationship or marketing group. Right. Yeah. So you can't I've, have. I've had many. You know, professional Hispanic organizations, uh, young professionals, the Latino community organization. I mean, there's many. Right. Yeah, anyway, you've got the, the concept I, very clearly. I those. Mm -hmm. Debbie, a tribe you're in, please, or being in. Um, bunko. What on oh, earth is Bunko? One. That's a great one. Yeah, absolutely. We call it Drunko. We do have Drunko. <laughs> it's just a mindless game that you play and you really get together to chat and eat. It's not really about the game. Yeah. But you have 12 core people that are your core. Yep. And when one misses, you know, you look for a substitute, but yep. you still have a really strong people. core that go throughout a year together. Or well, years. We've, we've done it. Or yeah. years this together. This is like our yeah. eighth or ninth year together. Very social. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. Sounds a bit tribal. <laughs> <laughs> Bunko, eh? Okay. Bunko. <laughs> Regina, a, a tribe, sweetheart. Sports. Yeah. Women in sports. Women, women, and more women. <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a tribe. Yes, that's true. <laughs> okay. What uh, number seven is almost going to almost going to tell itself, isn't it? What would that be? What's the, the next bigger issue? Global. Global. Yeah, well, let's just say mankind. Shall we? Yes. Don't want to be sure by me. Global. We're going to look at aspects mankind. of global. Uh, but the whole of the human race, you know, human, just hum, human, human. human beings, humankind. Mm -hmm. Humankind. Let's, let's call it that. As I'm in a society of ladies. Humankind. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a that's a, a responsibility zone, isn't it? I mean, if we if we screw up, and that goes. We're all gone. You know, there's no, there's no way that we'd survive, even if uh, you know we were the only ones left. You think, oh, that's great. At least I didn't get wiped out. And you wouldn't last long. You wouldn't last more than a couple of years, uh, knowing there was nothing else down the road. So humankind is a very important R zone. Can you see how these are getting kind of bigger and bigger concepts? What will be the next next up? I can't ask for examples of that because there's only one humankind. Yeah. Environmental. Yeah. Exactly. Can, can I? The planet? Can I? Yeah, exactly. Can I use biosphere? Are you okay with that? No. Why? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can challenge. You can challenge anything. You can challenge anything as so long as you can come up with a coherent argument, right? <laughs> um, 
but uh, it, uh, exactly, it has to do with ecology and environment. We all know that. I'm just picking the word biosphere for a reason, because planet Earth has a physical aspect as well, which we'll come to. But the the, the living aspect, the living part of planet Earth. Give me some. Give me an example, each of you, of something in the biosphere. Maybe maybe even if you like something, we should be concerned about and responsible for. Would it be like the elements, like water, fire, air? Oxygen, plants. Those, those, are, warming, those so. are physical things, really, and that's a physical thing. That may come next. No, uh, by the, the word bio means living, so we're talking life organisms, but bigger than humankind. So everything Even else, vegetation? everything else living. So, yeah, vegetation would be a good example of the biosphere. Save the whales. Whales, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Anything else well, off the biosphere? Uh, my mind went right to water. Water, as water, a, a, as a support for living things. Right, but that might come in the next okay. zone. Okay. Remember that, and then challenge me if you don't think it comes in the next zone. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, but there is, there are certain things about water. Don't uh, you know? I, I will speak to what you said. There's a lot of living life in the water. So yes. Well, ocean water, you know, is very much alive. It's filled, isn't it, with squillions mm -hmm. of life forms like planktons and. And even smaller things, you know, much smaller. So it's it's very much a living environment. So in that sense, you know, the ocean is the, probably the most important part of our biosphere. It could, we could survive. The Earth would survive. Humans and all, all living landforms being wiped out probably wouldn't make much difference as long as the ocean survived. Unfortunately, we're threatening the ocean too. But you know, everything was in the ocean for the first three and a half billion years. <laughs> you know, it's, it was very very complete to itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all interestingly, we, you know, we all carry the original ocean environment within us at exactly the same concentration as it was, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. The modern ocean is very much more concentrated than that, but our body tissues are thought to reflect the old oceans exactly. So we have a we have a strong interest in maintaining the ocean environment under our skin. Uh, well, then how does that work with the people that don't care for the ocean or don't care for the Right. Well, they're they're completely insane. Remember, as, as I said, <laughs> as I said, as I said, this is going to come. There is a definition. <laughs> Sanity and insane. I'm insane as well. <laughs> well, that's let's insane. let's let's finish our map, and then we'll see, then we'll see where people fit on it, right? If if they fit on it, uh, are we all clear? Are you okay with this? That we know what the yeah. biosphere is. It means all living things, but not necessarily the physical. That's why I drew back a bit when you said water, because the next one I'd put is the physical. Physical universe, and uh, that can be big or small according to how you want to think of it. Just planet Earth, or everything in the cosmos, every star, galaxy, and whatever. Gosh, it's tricky to write legibly like that. But no, oh, sorry, that's number nine. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> I mean, I know. <laughs> number nine, okay, for the camera. <laughs> uh, number nine is the physical universe, all physical things. That would include water, and as you rightly say, it's very supportive of us. Um, and there are, there are elements even to the physical. I mean, uh, Lyle Watson, do you know that writer? I do. He wrote a, some terrific books, but one you may not know is it's called The Private Life of Inanimate Objects. Have you read that? Well, he's talking about consciousness within physical things. It's a very fascinating book. And it goes from computers that switch themselves on and type messages when there's nobody there <laughs> to <laughs> considerations. Well, I said they have a life of their own. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. Terry says that daily. <laughs> yeah, well, th there are some, there are one or two very well established and very interesting stories that nobody's ever been able to explain. One of them that, uh, well, he, he does too, but one of them is a, a couple that lived in England. And the computer would, when they went out, would wake itself up, type messages, and when they came back, the message was there. Uh, he signed himself Thomas something. Now, you know, it's like 20 years since I read the book, so I, I can't remember the second name. But this Thomas used a, uh, an old fashioned computer. I mean, going back to the days of Atari and BBC computers and things. Uh, but he typed messages. Anyway, long story short, they got really intrigued that there was actually some being in this object and took notes, and uh, they were able to actually track down a person who, fit, you know, who fitted the description he gave them himself that lived in that cottage centuries before they'd ever been there. 
So, you know, it is possible for conscious entities to inhabit physical things. But he goes a little bit further and he's thinking in terms of actual physical things that have some kind of consciousness. I mean, you might, you've all been to Death Valley, have you all seen the Walking Stones? I mean, you might ask what the hell's going on there? Because nobody has any physical explanation as to how these stones walk about. The only thing that we do know is it doesn't fit any existing knowledge. Whatever it is, whatever the explanation is, it's outside existing knowledge. Are they actually conscious? Could they actually move around? There are people who, humans, who say, I'm conscious and I can move physical objects. So it's not that big a jump, is it, for objects to be able to move themselves? But you'd have to postulate the idea of conscious, aware objects. I not only don't have any trouble with that, I believe that's how it works, but it's not something I teach, because I don't think I can demonstrate that to anybody's satisfaction. Mm -hmm. But I believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a theory called animism, that everything is alive. Uh, the Japanese have it in Shintoism, it's in Hinduism, and even modern philosophers like Leibniz, the German philosopher, he had a thing, he called them monads, that everything was made up of little monads that were little alive things and he made up whatever it was, trees, bricks, water, everything made up of monads. Well, we don't need to be that, that complicated. Is that the concept that if, if we're all just energy, then it's all just energy? Right. If one energy is no different than the other energy, it's just how that energy is expressing itself? Right, I agree, absolutely. When you go to the f deepest level, then you've got to say consciousness creates everything, so everything is consciousness. Mm -hmm. So couldn't, couldn't be any other way. Right, now why did I stumble? Number 10. Uh, I'm going to put ideas because I'll get a, it's going to hurt my back to stay down there for too long. <laughs> but really, anything conceptual, a created things, art, history, as a concept, I think belongs on that level. And by the way, I'd put religions on the level of history. Most religions, if you look, they're really a historical thing. Uh, at least the differentiation of religions is just a historical thing. But, you know, you could put a Beethoven symphony here, you could say Encyclopedia Britannica. Knowledge and ideas and creative thought constructs, things that are special to us anyway. Well, everything being a thought first and a thing second. And a thing second, a yeah. Thing. That's what they say, isn't it? Well, that would, that would be consistent with building up your zones like that. But the uh, only place that that would be challenged is those people that walk up to a piece of stone and start carving with no picture of what's going to come out of that stone. So then that is not a thought and then a thing. That is just... Well, you know, that thing is emerging. Tell me what to do. Well, I think I've heard that too, but Michelangelo, he's often quoted with a famous mm -hmm. quote saying, you know, somebody said, how do you carve these beautiful things? He said, well, it, it's easy. I just t carve away the bits that aren't part of the statue. <laughs> right. So he must have got the statue in mind before he started, in yeah. his case, then. Yeah, well, that's curious. Yeah. Did he, or did what was there just come out as he started? I, I have no idea, because I'm not a sculptor, but I would, I would bet my last 500 bucks that the idea is there first, and they, they know how to go for it. They just, they just exactly as he says, take away the bits that don't fit. You know, we don't. This won't fit here. This is going to be in the crook of his arm. So I'll take that bit out. Surely. And he used to go and inspect the pieces of what he what he wanted to carve. You know, he used to go to the rock and choose it and said, I want that bit. <laughs> yes, it was that bit for that statue. Yeah. So yeah. But I we think. But we have a friend who had this beautiful tree in their yard, and they um, hired someone to come carve a bear out of that tree. And when, when the carver <laughs> came to that tree he, and started carving, he said, there's absolutely not a bear here. It is a Native American phenomenal, beautiful woman. That, wow. And that's what it is. And that's what became <coughs> really the spirit of that land for them. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, that well, that, that's probably, the, yeah. I would still argue that's the thought there exactly. first. But there are spirits and maybe ancestors there telling him. You know, they, they're probably the old tribal mm -hmm. spirits are there saying, no, it's not bad, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, Carl and he, uh, and he's, he assumes that to himself and thinks he's got clever insights, but was actually being fed mm -hmm. by pre-existing thoughts. So it doesn't prove or disprove it, does it? Yeah, no. it's no. just interesting. Anything else we might have mentioned that could fit in this zone 10? Uh, I probably won't get time today. I'm going to talk to you about encyclopedias uh, someday. Uh, I was doing a bit of research. It has to do with the uh, alphabet and other things, but 
I came across the fact that if you combine all, all the encyclopedias of the world, and in fact, that not even encyclopedias, like Wikipedias, there are something like eight, eight billion words in those. I forgot why I'm saying this. Oh, yes, the amount of knowledge. The, just the amount of knowledge that's contained in 26 letter squiggles that we call the alphabet. Uh, it's just absolutely staggering. The biggest, in, the biggest paper encyclopedia was Chinese. It had 114,000 books, whereas Encyclopedia Britannica is only about 30, isn't it? It's had 114,000. So you might, that, that's very much in zone 10, isn't it? In the human knowledge, the collective knowledge. And it got, I mean, it must have got pretty well overwhelming centuries ago. We got, you know, people talk about inv information overload now. But, you know, probably hundreds of years ago, there was too much for any one person to possibly try and grasp. All right, so what's number 11 going to be? What should we call that? If we are spreading outwards, maybe this is not such an intuitive outwards, spread outwards step. Um, I'm going to have to kneel because I'm going to have to write. <laughs> I'm going to write spirit, but, but I'm also going to enlarge that. And I'm going to say other spaces, other dimensions, what you want to call it, other unit, you know, multiverse, all of those things can comfortably fit on that level, which you might call the beyond. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it doesn't fit with normal things. It's out there. We know it's out there. But we don't exactly understand it to the full, but the phenomena that appear magical because there are no explanations. That's all that magic means, really. It doesn't mean magic. It just means you can't explain it. Whereas sometime later, you can explain it. So it's not magic anymore, like radio waves. You know, it was considered magic to be able to send a person's voice around the world. But, you, you know, now, now you know about radio waves. It's not a problem, is it? So, mm -hmm. uh, so but it, it appears magical in many senses. Once you understand additional universes, then you understand strange things where some, like Michael Talbot in his book, Holographic Universe, reports on a couple who are walking in the gardens of Tuileries, the palace in uh, Versailles, in Paris, sorry, not um, Vers uh, Tuileries, is not in uh, Paris, uh, not in Versailles, it's in Paris. But they suddenly felt very strange and started meeting people in old crinoline dresses that were talking old-fashioned French. And uh, You know, the, the story's worked up very much in full, but it's hard to not draw the conclusion that they'd slipped back a couple of hundred years. And that something had... It's a parallel, if the universes are all run, running in parallel? That's a tricky point, right? Uh, you, the, the famous story that everyone knows is the Rupert Everett's um, a multiverse thing, where every few seconds the universe divides. You know, that did happen and it didn't happen, it goes that way and, and so on. That's not widely accepted and it's a complicated and very clumsy theory and probably isn't true, but it might be. But a much more interesting parallel universe theory is one that's absolutely true, there's no question. It comes from mathematics. And you know, they've, they've done the calculations and predicted that without question, there are at least, uh, I think it was 500, uh, something to the power of 500 universes. And that you can say statistically, and this is from a scientific journal, this is not me going off at the mouth, right? That you can say for sure that there's an, in somewhere out there there's another universe with another bunch of people and a guy in a cerise jacket talking to a handful of women about something called crycinetics. Has to be, right? So the, the, that kind of parallel universe is an established uh, mathematical fact. That's not exactly the same as the dividing universe. That's not proven and some people believe it and some don't. So, but there are more than one dimensions. That's why I said other spaces. Do you all know what shamanism is? Have you all encountered shamanism? That's a big trip in other spaces. I consider myself a shaman because I've done it enough times to, to know what I'm doing. So although I don't heal that way and I've got a shingle, you know, I have gone off into other dimensions and done the odd things. Met my power animal and so forth, all very fascinating. Okay, anyone got any other comments or examples on our zone 12? So zone, our zone 11, sorry. Before we go on to zone 12. Okay, what would the, the last one, what would that be? Any guess? Well, not any guesses. You choose what to put on 12. You choose, and I'll, I'll tell you if I agree at the end. Except Viv can't vote, she knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, she knows what mine is. 
What would you it's put here? It's an already covered universe of under other spaces. I mean, I think yeah, uh, yeah, other spaces, the other, other dimensions, whatever. You know, I just, I just run out of words there. Oh, unknown. Yes, okay, we'll have unknown. Any other votes? No? Nobody wants another vote. How would uh, anyone want to go for God? <laughs> Yeah, well, God, God is the God is the short word. I'm not. I'm not. I, listen, I don't do God, that. God, God as a verb and not a noun. Right. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe in a silly old man with a beard that no. you know God. punishes the children he's supposed to love. Uh, so you can call it God, the big thing, the beyond. Uh, well, the beyond is perhaps the wrong word. Infinite uh, being, uh, creator of the universe. Um, uh, <laughs> Internet being, oh <laughs> and, and I was trying to work through that. <laughs> 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 okay. That's, internet being. Um, um, we are sure there's an internet being. <laughs> <laughs> there's a nasty little piece of work in my computer, anyway. I, there's an internet being. <laughs> yes. There's an old joke. What's the di what's the difference between a, a supermarket trolley and a and a politician? And the answer is that the supermarket trolley has a mind of its own. But but, <laughs> I, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I think I just on the spur of the moment think we might uh, might adapt this and say what's the difference between a, a computer and a politician? Yeah. The damn computer has a mind of its own. So I think we'll we'll amend this joke and start passing it on in in that form. Um, yeah. Anything. Any other sort of concepts here? That, that This is often fun to look at this level. I, I, I don't tell anybody what they're supposed to think at this level. You know, the God that I know and love has got nothing to do with anything I've ever read about. Uh, well, except in the broadest terms of, the, you know, the Brahmin ground, the consciousness ground, that's the root of the Brahmin religion, but it's got nothing to do with the Judeo-Christian. I don't know, person. I just always say it as something like energy, life energy, where does that come from? You know, we all assume there's a, like, a God or something because we're here and we exist. But to me, it's like there's much more beyond that because whatever happens, we all sort of coordinate and happen and function. And, it, and there has to be something much bigger that cosmic energy sort of, for it to, for the we start to run out of words, don't we? Yeah. I, I hear you, darling, yes, and I hear you too, too. No way to go beyond it, the infinite being. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what we would call universal consciousness. Yes, that's another term I've heard. And that's what I said when I, when I said the Brahmin, you know, from mm -hmm. the, that, that's what they mean, the universal con from which everything else appears. Mm -hmm. which, um, is, which is proven so often that a lot of times you don't notice that you just got the proof of universal consciousness. And that is really that second where you think about someone and a day later they appear in front of you. Or yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, you and I in the, we're just, what, what day is today? S <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> what? Well, we were together yesterday. <laughs> You're looking at me really blank. <laughs> And See how much I've messed with her mind in the last few hours. I handed you a piece of paper and was speaking with someone, and then I looked up, and that person was coming through the door. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. he asked me. And I said, "Did you call him, or did you talk to that person?" And she said, "No. I pulled this piece of paper out yesterday. This, and it had this person's information on it. And in walks that person today, and it's somebody that we." Would absolutely not have called or not have expected, have expected to show up. Be walking, yeah. mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. that's uh, yeah, synchronicity. Because I would have really that. liked a warning. <laughs> 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 and if she hadn't warned me, there was going to be an issue. It would be the tribal thing. Oh, yeah. Are your tribe? No, work, the work ethic, the, the immediate group around you at work. Work was, a, work was a different ethic. I chose that as number five. It's to what you do, but the people that you work with, if you have a 
Wouldn't they be your I'm, not, listen, I'm not saying they're not a team, and I'm not saying mm -hmm. they don't function like a tribe, but I, I'm separating work and the, the work group, that's you know, the company, the company's uh, mission statement, your workmates, colleagues, the customers, all of that belongs in that, sorry, I keep, uh, belongs in the, okay. the, the fifth they zone. they move from, you know, people that I started working with a long time ago when they were part of my work group, are no longer part of my work group, but now we're, you know, our own no, tribe, tribe community. Yeah. And friends. With exactly. Them, you know, that. So now yeah. Well, let's follow that through. You know, you can meet somebody at work and you get married, so all of a sudden they're, right. they're your so number three. Do <laughs> friends fall into community? Uh, I think most, most do, don't they? I mean, we do have friends at work, people we get on with particularly well. But otherwise, they're mostly community associated, if you think. Yeah. Going back to what Anita was saying earlier, though, with education, where do you, I mean, I sort of feel that that might have been another, another R zone in some ways, because it's such a major part of our life when we're growing up. Well, I'm not arguing, I'm just no. sitting here stunned by your incisive <laughs> uh, brilliance here, Danny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, you, could, you could take, <laughs> it's on camera, yeah, I could take this sort of, well, I don't know, I started to think to myself, am I just being lazy, saying, no, it fits all yeah. of it, or is it really a separate zone? I think, well, you might be right. I think it could be a separate zone because so many of us identify ourselves, our inner self, with our mm -hmm. education or lack of education. So it really influences how we work, who we hang out with, yeah. what we think of ourselves, you know, what mm -hmm. we talk about if we have the education or if we don't. And it could drive so, a, a passion or create a passion. Yeah. Well, you could also it say, fits. you know, it fits here with tribes, you know, alma mater, old school, all that stuff. And you can also, it fits here with ideas and libraries, encyclopedias, yeah. knowledge, learning. But I think Viv might fit on something. The only thing is, it's like, gang, I don't want 13 of these damn things. It's an awkward <laughs> number. <laughs> That's my I lucky mean, number, the, as it I'm happens. I'm a classic example of an educator, um, a person that had trouble with their education, but still managed to get a master's degree. But it's because I ended up doing something I really loved, which was my art, and got a master's in it. But if you look back at my um, education, I was pretty dyslexic, you know, not learning certain things, really bad speller, and had a lot of things that held me back. And yet, um, it's only in later life that now I see it as a problem, because I, I'm coming up against things where I wanted to change my career, and was doing, wanted to do nutrition. And all of a sudden I was hitting these huge words that I didn't understand, and then couldn't even remember, and it was really upsetting me. And when I'd done my art, it had never been a problem because I'd just gone on to that, ignored everything else. Mm -hmm. But then something else that meant something even more to me and was more important, um, a huge obstacle came into my way. And that's why I'm hoping with what Keith is doing, you know, it's gonna really, get me over that. Well, she solved it by marrying one of the world's top nutritionists, <laughs> didn't you? <Yeah. laughs> What's the master plan? <laughs> 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 Darling, my ego is everywhere. <laughs> it pervades the known my universe. It's everywhere. <laughs> but, but you can disguise your education all your life and nobody mm -hmm. would know. And I basically did it until then. I hit, when I was sort of 40, bing, I hit it in a really big way. Okay, let's roll, because we're going to run out of time. That, that was actually longer than I thought, and we enjoyed that, didn't we? It was good. But now, how are we going to lay these things out? One way that I started with, this is years ago, so right? Keeping us all feeling good about the whole thing, but we have delayed the process. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How would we stack them? Would you put 12 at the bottom, or you put 12 at the top? I'd put 12 at the top. Yeah? And one at the bottom. Does that mean you're sort of inferior in any way? You're at the bottom of the pile, you don't really That's count. That's our human perception of yeah, the stacking order. Right. Yeah. Of the stacking order. Well, it's kind of got that linearity, hasn't it, that is typical of the way people think. 12 in the middle. And <laughs> That's dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> and then have the others that. working towards Towards the common. Well, I've actually seen that model, and I couldn't tell you because there are 
whatever, but with the concentric circle. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, salt goes in the middle. Oh, right. Yeah, well, that's that's a. Why don't we do that one? Lay it out that way. Does this work? I'm going to run out of room. Kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger than that one. Let's do three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's still there. Well, it works in a certain sense, doesn't it? Like, you you know, you're. Your protoplasm line, sex part, and so on are all contained within the biosphere. So there's a well, certain, it certain on logic. Whether you believe that number one and number two are the same. I mean, number one and number two are the same. Oh, they're not. 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 My final model, I mean, I've been kicking this around for 30 years, right? but my final model is probably what you're saying, and I'm going to depict it as a clock and show it like this. Tricky. <laughs> I'll get there. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and here's the mark that cements it all. Right? Wouldn't that work? That the 12 creates your one and leads to your one. It actually creates your one. Does anyone agree with that idea? Is this the 12 isomes? Yes, yes. I've, I've laid them out like that. Laid them out as concentric circles. What about great. laying them as a wheel? Still. Yeah, they, yeah. The greatest, almighty, everything, universal consciousness, whatever you want is actually the source of our one. Mm -hmm. And I can't actually see it any other way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think you can depict that easily with these. That's not to say they're wrong. But I think that actually, as soon as you add the arrow, uh -huh. that yeah, depicts how I can... Yeah. Which you may have noticed. That's why I said when I had this, <laughs> when I had this one mark, it'll all make sense. <laughs> now, I, I did actually say, uh, you know, quite challengingly, we'll just have a couple of minutes on it, but in the, using these things you can define sanity and rationality. I mean. To me, anything that conflicts with too many zones, now it's not, you can't be perfect, you know, you can't not uh, on occasion produce harm in one zone. But if you're going to do something that messes up several of these at once, it's got to be insane. And if you're going to fool around with these, you know, the biosphere and the, the physical and humankind things to the point where that crashes, it's going to wipe out all the lower ones. That's, to me, that's completely insane. It's, uh, I can't think of a... So are you, are you talking about... The way you're living, the way you're living, how it affects those zones, or if you are not congruent with those zones. Congruence a good word. Congruence and balance are the two. Let me go on to write those down for later. But congruence and balance, I would say, are the two good words. You need to balance them all, don't you? I mean, yeah. you need to have some. If you so don't... If you're not congruent in a zone, in how you're living daily, that then could become the definition of insanity, or the example of insanity? Well, we'd have to consider degrees of insanity, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, completely insane, you probably, the person's probably completely out of touch and non-contactable. But crazy, nutty, destructive behavior, let's say, you can interpret on these zones, can't you? Mm -hmm. um, if, I mean, Which destroys the responsibility. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't suppose I'm, I'm dead set against sort of monks and nuns, but it's a strange life where you specifically rule out two of the most critical R zones that we all share and love and try to make work because they're very that precious to us, and they say, oh, to hell with that. that is, is that a so that solution? Is, that is insane. Yeah, it's not a solution, is it? It's just, oh, to hell with it. I don't care. Ignore it. A better answer is to solve each of these 12. And we've got, you know, processes and tricks and procedures to really enhance these, so it's great fun sharing those. But it also defines reason, doesn't it? Reason and rationality, not just like mad or the extreme outer degrees, but anything is reasonable or rational uh, if, it, if it integrates well with this balanced picture of you know, slicing up your universe into 12 bits. We're probably going to have to slice it up into 13, thanks to Bib. <laughs> 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 but I think she's right. I think it probably would count. I'll, I'll work on it, right? But we're all agreed it's important. Nobody's arguing with that. So the question is, does it integrate with the others or is it a separate area? 
um, and, and we'll see. Uh, now, there are some, there's a little bit of history that I'd just like to share with you and finish up with one thing, because I, I did want to try and keep it to like one topic for, per hour and then keep rolling. Um, but it's the, it, it's the definition of happiness and right and wrong. And I'm going to integrate the two in a little bit, in a sort of way. There was a man uh, called John Stuart Mill, who was a British philosopher. And he wrote about what he called the great goodness principle. And it was, in a word, it was like the, the most goodness for the most things and the most people. He didn't have any concept like this, or if he did, he never wrote about it. But if you put the two together, then you can say, really, really goodness is judged by how great it influences for the positive all of these different R zones. And then there's an earlier philosopher called Jeremy Bentham. It must have been an amazing... I've got, I always boast I've got like two million words in my word processor just waiting for me to sort of come and spew it up on Saturday afternoons like this. But he has two million words in his writings and he did it all by candlelight with a quill and some ink. Just wrote them out, scratched them with a pen. Two million words. And that was back in the 18th century, 1700 and some, Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham. But he called it the, the utilitarian principle. And it's, it's the same sort of words, you know, whatever does the most good for the many. And the great happiness principle, who, you know, whichever makes the most number of people and the most... Well, that was concentrating, I suppose, just on the, on the, uh, the seventh, wasn't it, humankind. But still, it would apply to this, you know, the more good you can do across the broadest range of these R zones, the more good your actions, the more happiness it's going to bring to the most people, and the vice versa. You know, if you, if you do something that's wonderful in one sense, but crashes the other 11. Uh, in fact, that we, can, we can go on insulting nuns and monks, can't we? Because they not, they're not only crash these, but they, you know, they're just obsessive on this one, uh, to, the, to the exclusion of all else. Uh, and they don't you know, well, anyway, uh, balance is the key. And uh, you, can, you can judge happiness and quality of action, merit, worth. All those kind of very difficult sub subjects suddenly become easier. They're never very easy, but it's easier to make judgments like that. So I think it's a very valuable tool. And I'm going to stop there. So anyone <laughs> want to say anything before I change gear and uh, change the pace and the mood significantly? Is that enough? Valuable? Do you think that's a useful insight? Okay, good. All right, let's stop the tape while I explain the next bit.